reading through the Bible in one year, January 31st, Genesis 34, Esther 2, 19 through 3, 15, Matthew 25, 1 through 30, and Acts 24, 22 through 25, 27. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when uh, Shechem, uh, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, uh, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. He raped her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, saying, Hamor, get me this girl for my wife. Now, Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant, very angry, because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing must not be done, because God had also said, you know, you shouldn't uh, marry within the people of the land and all that. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. We will give take our daughters for uh, take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be open to you. Dwell in it and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask for me a great bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father, deceit uh, Hamor deceitfully, because he had defi- uh, defiled their sister Dinah. He said to them, We cannot do this thing uh, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you become as we are, by every male among you circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and uh, we will take our daughters to ourselves, sorry, your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we'll be gone. So what they're saying um, is what really should have been done. Saying, okay, fine, but you are no longer your own people. You now become our people. And that's the goal. So if he takes them to be his people, And if they cease being their own people, then they would become as the Jews are. They would serve the God of the Jews and and follow along with them. So their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son, Shechem, which actually says how much he loved her. If he was willing to, not only for himself, but for his whole family, forsake everything they have so that they could belong to the people of Israel. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor... Um, and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us um, to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock and their property and their beasts be ours? Only let us have... sorry. Let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor, the, sorry, and his son Shechem. And every male was circumcised, and all who went out of the gate of the city. On the third day, uh, when they were still sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, um, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came in against the city while it felt secure and killed all the, uh, all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem um, with a sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field and all their wealth and their, sorry, all their little ones and all their wives and all that was in the houses and captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, but if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? I 
have many feelings about this. It's kind of hard to be clear on it. So I'm going to let it go as it is. Perhaps next time we go through it, we can discuss it. All right. Let's continue on. Esther 2, 20, sorry, 19 through 315. Now, when the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, and Esther had not made known to her, her kindred, sorry, not made known her kindred or her people. As Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as uh, when she was being brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, um, Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. That comes up later. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite. We'll hear more about his lineage later on, but just know that um, there are some people who uh, the people of Israel were supposed to wipe out, and they didn't. So they promoted Haman the Agagite, son of Hamathida, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And the king's servants who were at the king's gate bade, uh, sorry, bowed down and paid homage to, to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. And they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, as they had made known to him uh, the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, on the, sorry, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure. That is, they cast lots before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in, the, in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are very different from every other people. They do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Now, if it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver, that's a ton of money, um, into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the ha sorry, put it into the king's treasuries. So he's basically trying to bribe the king, saying that, you know, please let me kill these people. So the king took a signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Amathada, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you. Um, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes uh, were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month. And an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors um, over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to the uh, sorry, to every province in its own script and in every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet, signet ring. Letters went, were sent by courier to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every pro uh, province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Again, in the Greek, I guess in this case, the Hebrew, doi. Of course, they were in confusion. They were freaking out because suddenly the king's like, I'm going to wipe out all these Jews. And I'm like, what? Okay. So Matthew 25, 1 through 30. So this is kind of continuing. Well, not kind of. It is continuing the same thought um, from before. Where about no one knows a day and the hour, right? When Jesus is going to return. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. 
For the foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they became drowsy and slept, but at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The wise answered, saying, Seeing there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. While they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those uh, who were ready went in with them to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is a second warning for us to be um, prepared for when Jesus comes again. Here's another one. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents? Here, I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who also had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents? Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he had also received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you gathered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant! You knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The point is that we're all given, um, through the Holy Spirit, as Christians, we're all given something to do. right? We're all given some uh, gift that we can go out and do something with. And the point is that we should do something with those things. We should be constantly renewing our mind. We should be spending our time in the Word. We should be spending our time with other Christians. We should be finding out what our um, gifting is and using it to the glory of God. Not being a slothful servant, not having been given a, uh, a gift and being unwilling to do the work that God has committed you to. All right, let's go on. Acts 24, 22 through 25, 27. So continuing on, this is um, Paul having just given his defense about what was happening, right? He's now before Felix um, in Caesarea because he had to flee from Jerusalem because they were going to, they had a plot against him to kill him. So he fled to Felix, um, who then said, okay, well, the people in Jerusalem come up, make your accusation against him. We'll let Paul give a defense and we'll see what happens. So he just defended himself, right? Saying that he did nothing wrong, basically. Now, Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, meaning of Christianity, put them off, saying, when Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will decide your case. And he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. That was a common thing. So uh, like when it says, Or when Jesus says, uh, when I was sicker in prison and you took care of me, that's what it means. Um, Not that we should, you know, spend all of our time and effort taking care of people who were in prison. But in this time, uh, the people in prison got basically nothing. All right. They had no uh, food given to them. They had no clothing. They had none of these other things. They had to depend on their family to provide it for them. So that's what, that's what they mean. So that, yeah, he's going to be kept in prison. Um, or at least be imprisoned in Herod's Praetorium, which still isn't that bad of a place. Um, And 
that he should still, you know, his friends should be able to come and tend to his needs, right? After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he had uh, reasoned about righteousness and self-control in the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. And two years had elapsed, two years. Felix was preceded, sorry, succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix kept Paul in prison. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up from, uh, Jerus- sorry, to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning to ambush him to kill him on the way. Now, these aren't the same people who had um, made their vows that they were going to kill him. Um, there is an out clause where if you make a vow that's impossible to keep, like literally impossible, you can get out of your out of your vow. That's just the way it is. So this may be some of the same people who wanted to kill him or like, yes, I can finally fulfill my vow. But um, yeah, they urged him, asking as a favor that he summoned to Jerusalem. Right uh, now, Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, that he himself intended to go there shortly. So said he. Let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let him bring charges against him. After he stayed among them, not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. Now, if you looked at the map before, right, we saw... Down to Caesarea, this is actually downhill. It's physically up on the map, but it's it's actually just downhill for us. Um, Because Jerusalem itself is on a mountain, and you can see the the little rough drawings here of the, the mountain range that it's in. So it's actually down uh, at the coast of the sea. So there we go. Scrolling way too pa- far past it. Okay. And after he stayed among them, uh, not more than eight, 10 days, he went down to Caesarea and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, uh, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to have been tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you will go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa Uh, The king and Bernice arrived in Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid uh, Paul's case before the king, saying, There's a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give anyone up uh, before the accused met their fate. accusers face to face and had an opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day I took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried uh, there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him held um, until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I'd like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came uh, with great pomp And they entered the audience hall with military tribunes and prominent men of the city. Then, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. 
And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who were present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him, but I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him here before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Tomorrow, we hear his defense. Behold the word of the Lord. <laughs> 